Hello. Good. Thought I was going to have to do that analogue. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I had the pleasure of interviewing um, John Platt uh, about a week ago, and we got into his life story. Um, and I'm really proud of the piece, and uh, John gave a lot. And it's an amazing story, a trajectory from DJ in Denver all the way up to being one of the most influential music executives on the planet. All you need to know for today is um, he's killing it in America right now. In, in, in Q1 this year, it was his first full quarter as CEO. Uh, Warner Chapel posted its biggest market share for a decade. Uh, last year in the States, uh, he probably won't thank me for saying this, but Warner Chapel overtook Universal Music Publishing Group to become the number two publisher in the States, which when you compare the sizes of the parent companies is, is a, a, a humongous achievement. Um, today, we, we're gonna, what we're going to get into with John is actually the songwriting process and how Warner Chapel uh, gives input into that songwriting process and his relationship with Justin Tranter. Now, Justin's story is another fascinating one, uh, which I'll allow him to tell you, but suffice to say, he's had um, challenges in the, in the industry. He was part of a band that never quite got to the stage that he wanted it to. But with the help of John and um, his, his team, uh, Justin's become one of the go-to pop songwriters, or, or many genres um, songwriters in the world. And two tracks off the top of my head that you almost certainly know is Justin Bieber's Sorry, uh, that he, he played a key role in writing. Um, and also Cake by the Ocean, which I've probably just said that now. Not, you're not going to be able to get out of your head for the next two hours. Um, so please uh, join me in welcoming to the stage John Platt and Justin Tranter. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Um, as I say, we're going to get into really the songwriting process, how Warner Chapel helps with that process, uh, the demands, the terrible demands that John puts on you. Um, Justin, we were, talk we were talking earlier about how much effort you put in, right? People out here might just think you sort of, you know, drop into a studio, write sorry, and then nick off home for your dinner. It's not quite like that. Um, you, uh, you're, you, if you could tell the story from you being in, a, in, a, in, a, in an act that was a hot act, a priority act, um, but never, as I said, never quite got to the point you were hoping it would, and then through how hard you've worked to build your reputation as a songwriter as you have to this point. Sure. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Uh, so... Uh, yeah, I was in a in a band for almost ten years, uh, a, a glam punk band called Semi Precious Weapons, because um, the way to really break through in the two thousands is to be in a glam punk band. <laughs> Everybody's looking for that, and uh, but we did do amazing stuff, and we got to travel the whole world, and we opened for Gaga, and we opened for Kesha, and we did a whole bunch of cool stuff. Um, but we had were signed to four record deals and dropped <laughs> by all four of them. Uh, but the only play, I only have ever had one publishing deal, though. Um, I was signed, the band was signed to Warner Chapel in 2010, um, but they, nothing really, not much happened. Uh, and when John and uh, folks came in, everything changed drastically just because, um, well, I'll, I'll let you tell that part of the story. <laughs> yeah. sure. so, so this was in 2012, right, John? You, yeah. you, 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 you moved over from EMI Music Publishing to Warner Chapel. And at that stage, am I right in thinking that you were going through the contracts of the songwriters that were signed to the organization? Right. It was a, a legal meeting, actually. And uh, they were going through options and expiring deals. And the semi-precious weapons deal came up. And immediately it was like they were just rushing through it. Semi-precious weapons, like, no, we're not keeping this. and Because um, he had a really substantial publishing deal when they signed um, years prior. It was a huge bidding war for the uh, for the band. I was actually at EMI Music Publishing and we tapped out on the deal. <laughs> we were like, ah, I'm not going smart, over that number. Smart <laughs> and so, uh, but Warner Chapel signed the deal. And so when I arrived in 2012, it was just a matter of fact, like, oh, we're no, we're, we know we're dropping this. And me being new at the company, I just started asking probing questions. Well, why are we dropping it? Uh, the option's only this much. They said, well, we lost all the money. Why should we spend any more? I was like, yeah, but you already lost the money. And um, so it's gone already. Then the option isn't that much to keep it. Uh, and so in my asking probing questions, I finally just asked what I felt was an obvious question. Can anybody in the group write? And no one seemed to know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and um, awesome. And so I said, well, I think we probably should meet with them to see 
if they write. Now, I, I had heard that the lead singer was a writer. I didn't know if he was a good writer or not. Um, and so I asked Katie uh, Vinton, Katie Donovan at the time, but Katie Vinton now, I said, listen, I need you to set up a meeting with this guy, Justin Tranter, um, and see if he can write. I didn't, honestly, I didn't know if he could write or not. And uh, so Katie did the meeting, and she comes in afterwards. She says, he played me some songs. They're pretty good. Um, so I said, OK, well, what should we do? Should we keep him? She was like, well, you know, everyone says he did that big deal, and I don't want that on me. I said, hey, we weren't here then. I said, that's not, me and you didn't work here then. That's not on us. And so she kind of tried to get businessy on the deal. Um, as a lot of A&R people do now, it's kind of a messed up part about the business now, to be honest with you. Um, and so I just asked her a question. I said, can, because the option was a certain amount of money. I won't say the amount of money. And I said, can he make this amount of money back? Don't worry about the past money. Can he make that amount of money back? I said, because I don't want to lose another penny on the deal. Can he make that back? She's like, yeah, he can make that back. And we, um, we picked up the option. And she just started working him like crazy, putting him in sessions. And then they finally um, got some traction when he had the breakout single with Fall Out Boy. And we've, we've never looked back. So in, in reality, you know, it was, it was a lot of luck involved. And, and also it's this syndrome that, that I, um, I say about the music business quite often, is that there's so many people in this business that have been doing it for so long and they know a lot. And, and myself included, to be honest with you, and I, cause I always have to police myself and you know too much for your own good sometimes and you know so many reasons why something won't work, and you're right about those reasons, but in being right about those reasons, you fail to look at the one way that it can work. And that's all he needed was the one way that it can work, and we're lucky for it. <laughs> uh, J Justin has also worked with people ranging from Selena Gomez to Britney Spears, Gwen Stefani. Um, what Im impact did John coming in and Warner Chapel have on your career, and how does that differ from this sort of age-old adage that publishers hand songwriters a check and that's the end of the relationship. Yeah, I mean, the, the big difference is they've just put me to work. Um, so, I, I mean, honestly, once Katie started working me, it was like, a, 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 like a, a session every day for a couple months. And then like three months in, once my name was out there a little bit and she could get me in more, I'm a, I was in double sessions. I've been in double sessions every, almost every single day for three years. Um, you just explain what double sessions are. Double are. sessions, yeah, sorry. So like I start my first session at noon and I write until six and then I go somewhere else. I used to have to get on the bus, but now I can take an Uber, hallelujah. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and I go to another session and write another song. Um, and what I, I, it's so, because I, I, I am like so Warner Chapel, like team Warner Chapel till the end, which is really team John, Katie, and Ryan. Um, because, and everyone's like, well, why? What do they do? And I'm like, well, they do their fucking job. They put people to work. They put writers to work. They find us opportunities. Of course, you still have to write the fuck out of the song. You still have to do your, you have to do your part of it. But it's always, because most publishers, it's literally just a bank. Um, and what is so special about the, the world that he creates and the environment that he creates is that it's about letting writers find themselves. It's about letting writers do what they love. And most importantly, it's about putting them to work. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and before I come on to Katie and Ryan, and I want to get into that with John shortly. Um, when you wrote Sorry with Julia yeah. Michaels, did you know it was a hit from the moment? What was it like when you finished it? Did you go home and be like, I have just smashed it out of the park there? No. <laughs> um, there are certain songs you write and you definitely know when they're special. Um, like Selena Gomez, Good For You, we wrote on a Sunday morning and we knew that was really special. Or um, Cake by the Ocean, uh, when I did that with Joe and Matt, Man and Robin, um, we knew it was really special, but you don't know, I mean, who thinks a song called Cake by the Ocean might end up being like a global smash? Def I def didn't think so. Um, but Sorry um, was a, a night session on a double session day, and uh, Julia did not want to go, and uh, I forced her to, luckily. Um, and we just wrote it pretty quickly. It was like a, an hour and an hour, wrote the song and left. And honestly, we're like, oh, that's cool. Had no idea. You just never know. There was no production there yet. There was, you know, it was, so it's hard to really know. You can know what a good song is, but you don't know what's going to happen. 
I suppose you get a bit snow blindness. I think that's the phrase. When you're in the studio doing those double se double sessions, day in, day out, for all that time, I guess you're just knocking songs out, knocking songs out, knocking songs out. John, how did you know that Sorry was going to be special? Um, Katie sends me every song that um, our songwriters do that she works with. Every single song it lands in my lands in my um, music inbox, and um, I listen to Sorry, and I thought it was a really good song. I think Julia was singing the demo, right? Yeah. Um, and Julia was singing the demo, and I remember emailing her back, this is a really good song. And I didn't even know if it was for Justin at that time. I didn't know it was the Justin session. I was like, this, is, this, is a, this, is, this feels like special. And then about a couple of weeks later, she said, Justin Bieber really likes the song, and he's going to cut it. And even then, um, I wasn't sure it would be a hit. You know, I always tell people, my job is just to find great songs. Um, it's like the record company and the fans' job to make it a hit. We don't control that part of it, unfortunately. You know, there's, there's a lot of songs in my iTunes that I think are hits that have never been heard yet. Um, but uh, that's that's the part that is out of our control. I knew it was special though. Cake by the Ocean though, when that one came in, I used to blast that song in my office. Like I got a really good sound system, and I would play that song like crazy. I was like, this song is crazy. <laughs> and then and it it, it um, kind of disturbed me because it got off to like a decent start, and then it slowed down. And I was like, that song is a hit. And they kept working it and kept working it, and it broke through. And uh, so I'm really happy about that one. Uh, uh, Justin, but what's it like um, to create a song, for argument's sake, like Sorry, and then give it away? And that's it. And all anyone will ever write about that song in the press and blah, blah, blah will be about Justin Bieber, not Justin Tranter. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when I was... The yeah. checks say Justin Tranter. <laughs> That's right, bitch. Um, um, no, when I was young, of course, that idea horrified me. Um, and I have to say that, you know, uh, I'm not a firm believer in, like, everything happens for a reason. I think if you work your ass off, everything can maybe happen for a reason. Uh, and I like to think very positively. And so when I look back on everything... I am so grateful that I tried so damn hard to be an artist and failed pretty miserably, pretty publicly. Um, no, we had a cult following and stuff like that, but you know, a lot of people lost a lot of money on my band. Um, but I am really grateful for that because now I don't want that. I realize how, how it's not fun. <laughs> it's not... Um, a good time, and so when I'm in a session, I can actually, I am writing, it's, now I have so much fun being like, what's your story? What do you wanna say? Whether it's the artist or whether it's a co-writer. Um, I, like, I had, that's a, it's a whole new thing because I had 10 years of doing, wearing, saying, feeling exactly what I want, and I wore some really great stuff. Um, <laughs> but, so now I love it. I love to give the song away. It's so exciting. Where I think a lot of younger songwriters they, ha they struggle with that, and it's a big struggle where if, uh, they, they want the shine and they want people to know um, that it was their idea and it was their doing. But luckily, I've been through that, so I can just focus on helping other people do their thing. Uh, we was, one second, Tim. Um, that was one of the things that Katie, that spoke to me very early in the process with Justin, is she would put him in these sessions, and, and some of them would be artist meetings or whatnot, and she would say to me, and nothing was happening yet, but she would say to me, artists love him. Artists, artists really love him, and it was because he was an artist, and he could relate. I remember we did this meeting at Rock Nation with Kylie Minogue, remember that? And so, um, and so we had some songwriters there, and Justin walks in, glamorous, <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> and uh, and it, the, to me, the meeting was like, okay. You know, I didn't really get anything from it. I was like, ah, we'll see what happens. And the next day, Katie's like, Kylie loved Justin. Like, uh, and I didn't catch that connection. And she, he, he has a really strong connection with artists and make artists feel comfortable and, and, um, and, and bring their best self out of them. So, um, J John's pretty generous in his praise of two individuals in particular in his A&R team when it comes to this story, uh, which we've mentioned, which is uh, Katie and Ryan. Um, those are the guys that you credit for turning around Warner Chapel to a great degree. You have a lot of faith in the pair of them. We've mentioned Katie a lot here, who I know works really closely with Justin. Um, what I find particularly uh, inspirational about their story is that these weren't like big executive A&R signings splashed across Billboard or wherever. Um, those guys had very different stories and you've mentored them from not really having much influence in either organization that Bud's mentioned to being the stars of Warner Chapel. Uh, Katie was John's 
PA, for us with Brits, or uh, executive assistant, I suppose. Personal assistant to your Americans out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, and uh, EMI Music Publishing, and John brought her over. She wasn't a member of the A&R team. She was personal assistant. Um, and Ryan was already at Warner Chapel, right? And that was like a rough diamond that you've helped polish and, and through his come. So can you just tell us a bit about your mentorship of them, what you demand from them, and how you've taken, especially Katie, from what she was to what she now is? Yeah, um... Well, when I was at EMI, uh, when I became president of West Coast or US, one or the other, and I, um, I immediately, the first thing I did was I wanted the assistants to be in the A&R meetings. We would have these A&R meetings, it would just be the execs, and they're actually kind of lame, to be honest with you. Um, and so, <laughs> they were. And so, I, uh, I said, I want the assistants to come into the meetings, and some of the execs really weren't feeling that, to be honest with you. Um, they didn't say it because they knew better, but their body language said it. And I, it just struck me like, how can you, it, it wasn't to have the assistants come into the meeting to take anyone's job. Um, not even close to what I was thinking, but my view was they listen to music too. They, anybody in the, who works in this company, they listen to music, they have ideas, They. They have friends who are writing songs or in bands or whatnot. And so I had the assistants come into the meetings. And one meeting in particular, um, one of the executives, senior executives, brought in this, this girl. And she's like, oh, somebody just gave me this girl. I'm not really into her. but And she played it. I was like, oh, I know who that is. That's Mozella. Because um, one of our songwriters that I had signed had worked with her. And he had sent me a couple of songs that I liked. Um, and so. I was like, oh yeah, I know her, she's pretty cool. I said, but my plate is full, I can't do it, but I'm a fan, and Katie, who was an assistant at that point, um, she says, I, I know Mozella, I love her, I've been following her online for forever, and she starts saying all these facts about Mozella, and I was like, okay. I said, well, all right, listen, we'll do the deal, I'll do it with you. I said, but it's your deal, you're gonna work it. And so we signed the deal, and Katie, started putting her in sessions. And Mozella had a recording contract at that time. She was an artist on Motown. And so the album came out. And before that, Katie started putting her in all these sync sessions, like having all these showcases for sync um, and so on and so forth. And, and so she started to get traction and a lot of sync uses from her music. Album came out, did nothing, and she got dropped. And so Katie, Katie was like, oh man, Mozella got dropped. I was like, that's the best news yet. She's like, what do you mean? I said, because they weren't doing anything with the record. Now she has time to just write. And so she kept writing, and she built herself up into a mid-six figure um, royalties of just sync licenses. We were just like plugging her with sync, and she was making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year just in sync. And then we did a master's program where she started re-recording EMI masters, and she would own a piece of the master, and she was making money off of that. And so Katie just had it. And then she was working with me, and I'm a pretty, you know, I'm a nice guy, but I'm pretty hard. Like, I drive pretty hard. And so she sat, shot, sat shotgun on me with a lot of deals, a lot of dealings with songwriters. And so she just learned it. With Ryan, uh, he would always call me for advice when I was at EMI. And just he just would reach out. So when I started to work with him at Warner Chapel, it was just a natural progression. Um, of me being able to work with him hands on, and I could actually just share all of my secrets with him then. <laughs> and so, uh, and they just they just have this drive. Uh, their musical sense is is fantastic, and you know my thing has always been I approach executives like I approach songwriters. Is I don't usually chase the superstar songwriters that are already hot. Um, you know it's good business to do it sometimes, and and we all have to at times, but. My thing is I always have liked to find, for 20 years I've been known for developing songwriters and signing them at the beginning of their careers. Um, a lot of people know that a lot of the songwriters that I've worked with, you know, Jay, Beyonce, Kanye, Drake. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty, you know, uh, overwhelming list at times, but I signed them all at the beginning of their careers before they were superstars. And I take, take the same approach with executive talent. I like to develop executive talent. Now, it's, it's a passion of mine. I didn't really want, and I mean this is no disrespect, I didn't want any like recycled executives. I feel if you keep doing the same thing with the same people, you're gonna get the same result. 
And and so I wanted to give young people a shot, and, and it works out. We can see the result that's happening now. To the end of the Mozilla story, because I know you want this to get to Ryan, is that this Katie, personal assistant, put her hand up. John's impressed. She's got the eye of the tiger. That's the phrase used to me. Mozilla goes on. Katie sticks by this writer, gets the record deal drop, and then writes. She wrote Wrecking Ball for Miley Cyrus. So it's... Um, that was after we left here, my unfortunately, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we we, we signed her. So. <laughs> uh, Justin, I want to get your perspective on why you think. I mean, uh, I'll just run through those stats that I mentioned at the start again. Warner Chapel just had its best quarter in a decade. John, John at the top of the organisation. These two hungry A and Rs that he's brought through. Um, won Pop Publisher of the Year at the ASCAP Awards recently. Uh, why do you think Warner Chapel has been so transformed? Why do you think it's having such a great run? Uh, I, th I think that it, it feels like a real team. You know, I, I know every single person on the ANR team. Um, not obviously Katie's who I deal with <clears throat> 20 times a day, but there's also this thing. If, if I reach out, if I email Katie saying I want to work with so and so, if she knows that Ryan has a better connection or that Mark has or someone she immediately sees, sees them on the email, asks them to help, uh, which I think a lot of executives, you know, it's kill or be killed. And so there isn't that teamwork. Uh, so there's real teamwork. There's like even the writers. We all feel like a family. We all like feel like we're part of like the winning team. Um, and I think that that's just the main. It's just it's, it's everyone's working really hard and everyone enjoys each other, um, which obviously always starts at the top. And it, it has to that feeling of like ownership of of what you're doing has to come from the boss. And luckily he creates that in everybody. I mean, well, one thing that I've got from speaking to both of you is this. Um, this core of work ethic. Um, John said to me the other week that, you know, if a big songwriter takes a day off, that's a gap for another songwriter to get into. I hope you don't mind me telling the story, but earlier you said if you see a songwriter on holiday on Instagram, you're like, get in. Oh, I am so happy when I see other writers on vacation. I'm like, you better be on vacation. Get the hell out of here. Um, <laughs> you know, I was actually nervous, like posting pictures being you know, in Cannes. And I'm like, oh, they're going to think I'm on vacation. No, bitch, I'm working. <laughs> J J John, uh, is, it, is it fair to say that you, you struggle with a lazy songwriter? Clearly, Ryan is at the other end of that spectrum, but you struggle Sorry, with can it. you repeat that? Is it, is it fair to say that you would struggle with a lazy songwriter, someone who slows oh, down? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, we get it rectified pretty quickly. <laughs> um, I, 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 I don't like lazy people in general. Like... I actually say I hate lazy people. My friends laugh at, laugh at me all the time when I say that. But uh, I think it's, um, listen, when you sign a songwriter, I, I always say I've never signed a songwriter that I thought would write the number 30 song on the chart. I sign songwriters because I think they'll write the number one song on the chart. And some have done it already, and some haven't done it yet. And you have to like work really hard at that. And any, any writer I've signed, I signed them because I felt that they would write number one songs, not for any other reason. I was like, they're going to write a number one song one day. And so when I, if it doesn't happen because it just hasn't happened yet, that's one thing. But when it doesn't happen because of lack of effort, that's something completely different. I feel that people like Justin, um, any, songwriter, any songwriter that's out there, you're, you've been blessed with a gift. And so for you to like disrespect that gift by not putting your all into it every day, it's just, I just have a problem with that. The only thing I ask for a songwriter for is for you to work as hard as yourself that I'll work for you. That's all I ask. I'll get you to the plate, but you gotta swing the bat. I don't, I can't, I don't write a song at all, you know what I mean? I know how to tweak songs with suggestions, but I have never written a song in my life. Um, so I just want writers to do their thing. And did you see that work ethic? Because we see these superstars that you signed when you were, uh, when, they, when they were younger, from Jay-Z to, um, well, obviously you've signed Beyonce, uh, Drake, who you mentioned, for, you Revolver Pharrell very early. Mm -hmm. um, did you see that drive and that determination in all of those acts? Oh, absolutely. I would have never signed them if I didn't. I've, I've met with a lot of successful songwriters that are really, or songwriters that I will believe will be successful, or some that are already successful, and we just don't click. Because I can just tell. Like, I just, I've been doing this for a while, and I know what's going to happen once you get that check. And I'd rather you happen somewhere else. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know. I, I'd just rather it happen somewhere else. And I've, I've walked away from, from some pretty, you know, pretty talented songwriters. And, and it's okay. And some talented songwriters have walked away, didn't feel like they wanted to sign with us. I feel songwriters should be where they want to be. You know what I mean? I, I, if I'm really aggressively going after a songwriter and they say they don't want to sign with Warner Chapel or when I was at EMI, sure, I'm bummed. But I'm also, like, happy for them. They should be where they want to be. 
I'm not that guy that like, um, which happens a lot when you're negotiating a deal and then it doesn't happen and then you, you're like, oh man, you get all mad and you don't like them anymore and so on and so forth. I've never been that person. And I also know, and this is gonna sound arrogant, but it is what it is, every deal has an expiration date on it. And so I know that if I was really that, you know, attracted to that songwriter, the deal would be over in three or four years and I'd be right there waiting because I already know what the, what the other company's not gonna do. So I'll just, I'll just say it. And I say that because I always tell songwriters too, I know what you're gonna be calling me in a year saying, I've seen this movie a lot of times and uh, you know, more times than not, they'll call and say, I should have did that deal with you. You know, and it's to, to Justin's point about the team effort, it's not just me. You know, at 20 years ago it was, but once I've moved into a leadership role, it wasn't just me. One of the first things I did, because A&R is like, like I signed Justin. If I were to sign Justin, Justin's my songwriter. That's how it works in companies. And one of the first things I did at EMI is like, these aren't your songwriters anymore. They're EMI songwriters. And everybody should be able to work with them. And because my view is, even if I do everything right, everything right, it's still only my point of view. Who's to say Katie doesn't have a point of view that can help? Justin, who's to say this one doesn't have a point of view that can help Justin? If, if the, the writer should get the best of the company, not the best of one person. And 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 Justin, uh, as time ticks down in front of me, irritatingly, because I could do this for another hour plus. Um, what's next for you? You've written these two smashes, "Sorry" and "Cake by the Ocean." It's time to chill out for a little while now, isn't it? No, there's no chilling out. Um, I mean, luckily, you know, I, it's the dream to do what to make money off of what you love. Um, I mean, a lot of what I do is it's a lot of hard work, but it's also a lot of like hanging out with your friends and drinking, but there happens to be a microphone on. You know what I mean? Like anyone that needs to go on a lot of vacations and take a long break, I, I don't understand that mentality. Um, so in, in what we do, in, in what our jobs are. Um, for me, I mean, what's next is just to keep writing, keep writing as much as I possibly can, but also like with the DNCE, Cake by the Ocean situation, I got to really dig into that because I, I was there like for the first couple days and I kind of was you know, able to help crack the code of the sound with Joe Jonas and um, one of my song titles became the band name and I put the bass player from my old band in that band and that kind of sparked this amazing thing of like I really love being there to help create the whole thing. Um, so I am signing a couple artists and developing a couple acts um, very slowly and very surely. And so that'll be the next step, but really just to focus on what's working. You know, I think a lot of people make the mistake that once they get the big mainstream success they were looking for, that then they immediately start, you know, launch a t-shirt line or some shit. And it's like, you make music, not t-shirts. I hate when that happens. <laughs> it's, people do it all the time. It's I like, hate when that happens. Like, uh, I started a trucking company, really. <laughs> 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 so I'm going to focus on writing, um, and, but also get a little bit more in, with, with developing artists and that, in that side of it too, which to me is, the, is a part of the songwriting. You know, when you, as a writer for someone else, every song should help their brand and every song should take them in the next step of their story. Um, so I guess that's, that's the plan. Um, <clears throat> and very quickly, I just wanted to ask you for a finish with John. Why do you think it is that John's been so successful throughout his career, signed all those amazing songwriters, you know, yourself included, and you're in that bunch? Um, and now, why do you think, you know, Warner Chapel is doing what it's doing, and, sorry, John, but hurting its competitors as it is? Uh, I think that having a good personality and working really hard, normally those things don't go together. Um, and I think that that's what John has, is that he has a personality where you trust him because you should trust him because he's a nice guy, uh, but also will work really, really, really hard for you. Um, and I think that combination is very special and obviously very lethal uh, and can get a lot of amazing things done for a lot of people. And the, the main thing, right, that a publisher is supposed to do is supposed to get amazing songs to the world. That's the point. It's like our dreams are to write songs because we want people to hear them and we hope that they make, the, even if they just make their life better because it's a silly song, that's the goal and that's what he and his whole team does. And that's the, you know, they've made my dreams come true, which is insane because I was definitely like two months from quitting, like had the full plan, like done, out of here. So it's pretty, 
Insane. I, I can well imagine John wasn't having any of that. <laughs> John, what's, gonna, what's, what's happening with Warner Chapel now? You've got to this point, right? Um, uh, as I said earlier about the parent companies, financially, um, uh, headcount-wise, you're smaller than the companies that you're now beating. Like, how do you keep that up? Can you keep that up? And where do you go from here? Um, yeah, we better keep it up. <laughs> um, really, my focus now is to push our... Um, the way we're working in the U.S. out to the rest of the world now. Um, you know, the U.K. has gotten a lot of it. I've been in the U.K. more in the last, you know, six months, six to nine months than I've been in my entire life. Uh, it's an area that's really important to me. I, you know, full disclosure, I felt we've under underperformed in the U.K. for uh, a really long time. And just look at, as I look through the, um, the financials and the stats, it, it proves it. And so we made some changes in the UK, and I know we are going to be off to the races, but that's been a really strong focus of mine. Um, I think we had the, you know, the nuts and bolts of a really great team, and now we've, we put a, a new leadership in place, and, and we'll, we'll get a couple of other new tweaks to it. But I'm really excited what the future of the UK will bring. It's the second you know, biggest music market in the world for us. And uh, so it's important that we deliver there. So I'm really excited about that. Thanks. Well, um a brief plug before we get off the stage and let uh, Tim and Daniel come on. Uh, if you're interested in John's life story, it's an amazing life story. If you go on musicbusinessworldwide.com, you can read it today. <laughs> plug! Uh, yeah, I had to do it. Uh, but generally, it's fascinating. And what he's achieved and the journey that he's been on is just incredible. Um, and long may it continue. Um, I would like to say thank you to the pair of you for giving so much to the audience today. John, Justin, cheers. Thank you for having us. Thank you.